Hi, welcome to Mind Matters. We're so happy to have you with us today. This is a podcast where we talk about mental health issues, concerns, topics, trends, you name it, we talk about it. I'm your host, Wendy McCarty Van Bemmel. I work with our four hospitals here in Central Florida, Central Florida Behavioral, University Behavioral Center, La Amistad, and Palm Point. I'm going to have my co-host and guest introduce themselves as well. Hi, I'm Shani Sloan. I'm a community outreach liaison at University Behavioral Center. My name is Carrie Griffin, and I'm the LGBTQ Veteran Care Program Coordinator for the Orlando VA Healthcare System. Thank you guys for being here today. I'm so excited to chat a little bit. Our topic today is Spectrum of Support, LGBTQ Plus Mental Wellness. So we have lots to talk about. Um, I'm just going to jump right in here, Carrie, and ask you uh, a little bit about, let, let's say we have someone who identifies as LGBTQ. Maybe you can explain that a little bit to our viewers who may not know what that acronym means. Um, So for someone who's looking for mental health care, what would someone look for if they're looking, let's say, for inpatient care? So first, LGBTQ and usually the plus sign that follows it is for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer and related identities. Um, We have a large community here in the central Florida area. um, And mental health care comes in many forms, obviously, as you know. Uh, We have mental care inpatient and outpatient at the VA, but that exists in many of the hospital systems that you mentioned as well and also um, other care facilities in our area. Um, And so when you're an LGBTQ individual seeking out care, it's going to be very important that you find a safe and welcoming environment that will be respectful of your sexual orientation and or gender identity. And that is not always the case, especially in areas and states like ours where it can be very challenging to find somebody that's going to support you on whatever your goals are for mental health care or your transition journey goals. And sometimes they coincide with each other um, or looking to get into recovery and stay in recovery along with um, getting proper and appropriate mental health care that's affirming and supportive. So. Um, It can be challenging, but we do have a lot of great providers and facilities and organizations in our area, which is definitely an upside. Yeah. um, Yeah. Those seeking out care. What um, questions would you consider asking someone? um, Let's say you're looking for residential care. We'll just use that as an example. What kind of questions would you want to ask? that facility? I feel like for me, when I'm talking to other facilities or just talking to people in general that are looking for care, it's it, there's three specific questions I feel like asking a, a potential treatment provider. It's, um, you know, how how do you approach LDB, LGBTQ services? You know, is it, you know, you have something specialized or is it more, you know, we want you to be with the general population and treat it as general population because sometimes we can uh, put people in too many boxes where they really just want to feel open. Um how do you deal with preferred pronouns, preferred mm-hmm. pronouns, preferred name it, or, um, you know, preferred gender identity if it, there isn't a legal aspect to it? They haven't changed their name yet. They haven't um, gone through medical transition. They aren't on hormone therapy. Those aren't indicators that someone is transitioned enough. So, you know, how how do you approach that? And then the third one is, are you a registered safe space? Mm-hmm. Um, just because there are some I don't know all of the bullet points and maybe you can elaborate too on like what exactly a safe space is. Um, but that's something I ask a lot of times is, are you a registered safe space? Because in Orlando, at least we have the um, Orlando Police Department Gay Alliance of officers and they will come out and actually give you a denotion of a safe space, which is incredible. Um, but there are some questions that they ask and things that they make sure we have, like two sets of locked doors. We allow someone to stay here while they report a hate crime, things like that. So you know, how do you approach the treatment? You know, how do you treat, you know, the non-legal part of, you know, gender identity and sexual orientation? And are you a safe space or my big three? Yeah, we did that actually at our Orange County sites with the Orlando VA Healthcare System and Orange County Police Department um, had our Lake Nona and Lake Baldwin sites designated as safe places. And um, as Shani was saying, like they anybody, not just veterans, anybody that's LGBTQ can come into that space that we will assist them if they feel they're being followed, harassed, bullied. And so those safety symbols, as we call them in VA, are important. And it's not just for our veterans. It's for our community at large as well. So 
Um, we had those designations for that. You're absolutely right. Looking for places like that and places that have safety symbols. You know, are the staff wearing rainbow lanyards? Are, are there safe place designations or safe place designations? Are there posters on the wall that says, please tell me your name and pronouns when you check in or or you go on the site or you go to our community resources like the LGBT Center. You go on the directory. Are these people that were affirmed and uh, by those in the community to be a safe place to go for uh, legal needs or medical needs or mental health needs? And that's important is utilizing and pulling on those community resources that might have those individuals that they know from the community at large that have said these people are people that I feel safe getting my care from kind of thing. I like that. Those yeah. are great yeah. ways I've to have. And, and in both ways, I, I know both of you have been working in the Orlando area for longer than I have. And has there been, at least in Orlando, a difference since the Pulse, um, like since Pulse happened, the shooting happened, has there been an uptick in need? Um, I know that when I was living in South Florida, I started to see a few more um, LGBTQ support groups and grief groups around it. Um, but I, I've seen, I mean, the Pulse Foundation still has everything where it needs to be. And they used to have an officer and a therapist on site. And I know you've worked with them for, for a while, but have you seen an uptick in, in kind of the need or less stigma on getting the help because of it? I think yes to both of those. I think there was less stigma initially after Pulse happened. And I think the community really rallied together, which was great to see. Um, one of the things I said right after Pulse happened, it's great that all these people reached out to me. I lost a friend. My friends lost family members and friends. And I did a lot of work at the VA and in the community in my own time afterwards. And it was great to see that. But I always said, like, this is wonderful, just like after 9-11. But it fades over time. And if you consider yourself a good ally, I mean, if it's easy to be an ally, then you're not doing it right, is what I always say. Okay. So, so true. you know, it tapers off. And I said to all these people that I talked to after Pulse, like, great, you're here now. I want to see you in a year, two years, mm -hmm. five years, 10 years down the road. And let's be honest, a lot of those resources dried up. People walked away. And, and then it happened all over again. We just did a Club Q one mm -hmm. year remembrance a week ago on the Transgender Day Remembrance. And so it brings it back up again, but then it tends to fade again. And I think that's where we have a problem. What I have noticed, though, is an uptick in people looking for mental health care with all the things happening in the state of Florida specifically. This year has been quite challenging, and I have seen an uptick in those individuals coming in to get mental health care that weren't before Absolutely. because of everything going on. So I've seen an uptick mm -hmm. again, but for another reason. Well, those few weeks after some legislature was passed about ability to receive hormone replacement therapy, we had, I, I don't know the exact number, but I started to notice a trend of in the following month, we had more patients come in with differing gender identities than normal. And I was like, you know what's happening you know is there is it just random and then i think we met uh, right. at a meeting like a couple weeks <laughs> after and i we talked about it. i was like oh my god you're right like yeah. it when access to uh care that affirms your identity and creates positive mental health stimulus when it's taken away it creates an environment for crisis so it was, it was interesting to see that that transition what would you say are some of the issues specific to someone who identifies as the LGBTQ plus um, along the lines of mental health that might be a little different from someone else? Well, there's two things. I always say when I'm doing trainings for people that they have a lot of the same issues that everybody else has. And so, you know, try not to focus solely on the LGBTQ stuff. Okay. Uh, because there are still a person who has anxiety or sure. depression or PTSD or what have you. However, that being said, there may be additional things going on like, hey, I'm not quite sure about my sexual orientation and or my gender identity. I need to explore that. I need to figure out who I am and what direction I'm going. Is this creating my anxiety or was my anxiety there first? And then this is just compounding it. So teasing all that out in therapy is is helpful to the individual. But knowing that even if you tease out your sexual orientation and you say, oh, you know what, I think I'm pansexual or I'm non-binary is my gender identity, it doesn't necessarily make all the anxiety, depression, and PTSD go away. Um, I always say when I'm working with gender diverse patients is like, let's build a life, life worth transitioning for because transition is not the sole goal here. We have to think about the whole picture, the whole health of the person mm -hmm. and 
figuring out one's identity is great, but it doesn't make all the mental health issues go away sure. uh, kind of thing. And so um, just making sure to be cognizant of that when working with LGBTQ individuals is important. Um, and then also not dismissing, you know, sexual orientation and or gender identity for somebody. I mean, don't automatically assume, well, this person's gay, so obviously they have problems. Well, that's not true for everybody, just like all the straight cisgender individuals in the world. You know, it's not true for them either. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to kind of take all those into consideration. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard this thing once when I was talking about putting people in boxes. I, I remember it's like allowing people to put themselves in the box. You leave the box open. And it's like, okay, well, if you want to go in the box, it's there. Um, but if you don't want to go in the box, everywhere else is available because I'm a person in long-term recovery. And I remember the first meeting, I looked at a meeting list, right? And there's one meeting on Wednesdays. It's at the LGBTQ center. And I saw LGBT and on it. And I was like, oh, like, it's not just people in recovery. I'm going to walk in and there's going to be people in recovery who also have something else in common with me. Because right then I was exploring the idea of it. And I was like, you know, I know I may not find the camaraderie in their recovery, but I know I'll find camaraderie in their identification. Sure. And it allowed by putting a bot, putting myself in the box, I opened up an opportunity for myself. But a lot of times, too, um, you know, being the token gay person, the token, you know, lesbian, whatever that looks like when someone puts me else, in, but someone else puts me into a box. I tend to uh, shy away from the opportunity because I'm like, I don't want to be just this. Um, so that makes sense. Especially, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're a professional in mental health, you know, focusing more from what you're both saying on mm -hmm. the person and let them tell you, why are you here? Rather than assuming because you have rainbow hair right. that you're here for right. LGBT people. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that makes so much sense. So I work with a lot of families at our hospitals um, where the children are exploring their genders or identities or there's some issues related to that. Can you talk us through a little bit about a parent that's maybe trying to navigate this for their child? That can be for or with their child. Yeah. Like, because even at the VA, yes, we treat adults that are veterans. Yeah. But these adults, when I do trainings all the time, I say these adults have children. Um, some are minor children and some are adult children. And sometimes they come out to their parents and then the parents come to me and they're like, what do I do? Right. You know, um, and I always love it when they say, what can I do to be supportive? Because just that one parental or adult figure decreases suicide exponentially. Mm -hmm. So I make sure to thank the parent or guardian or whoever it is, grandparent sometimes, like you just coming forth and saying, how do I support this child is more meaningful than you will ever realize. So just that one factor right there and thanking that person for being willing to learn more and figure out how they can do better okay, um, and do right by their loved one is important. Um, but then, you know, having individual counseling for that individual yeah. and then either couples and or family counseling can be very beneficial too in kind of working towards does it always work out well no i've had plenty of couples that have said we're not going to continue together you know i married a man and that's and i get that that's not your sexual orientation if your partner transitions how do we do that amicably and appropriately and respectfully especially if there's children involved um, and then the family situation how do we make sure that if the family can stay intact, how do we do that together that everybody feels validated? And then if we can't do that together, how do we do that so everybody is respectful and kind and continue to support, maybe from a distance, each other, um, even if it's not face-to-face? -face. Um, but definitely, definitely important if we can manage to do that together versus fighting, which doesn't get anything anywhere. Um, and then it continues to invalidate the person, whether it's the child or adult, that's saying, um, this is who I am, this is how I identify, um, and not to minimize that or discard it. Um, because, again, that creeps suicide, it creeps substance use, it creeps depression and anxiety back in the door um, if it tends to be that way. So having the yeah. supports, like you mentioned, even outside of the family are essential for that process. Yeah. And I was uh, talking, I think, earlier this week about the what came first, the the mental health concern or the self-medication. And uh, it was it was I wanted both of your perspectives on like how um, self-medication or self um, like outlet therapy, self-harm wise, how people um, a lot of times, you know, for me, I 
knew my gender, I my gender identity, my sexual identity. I was aware of that, and I didn't have a lot of self medication around that with my substance use. But I I know I've worked with people who've come into our facilities or in our community who, you know, it's a huge part of why they weren't comfortable coming. They were like, I can't come out, so they self medicate to deal with it. Um, what what is your perspective, at least, of the self medication trends that you've seen? Um, well, I mean, that's true of and even the straight cisgender individuals mm -hmm. of the world. You know, how do I escape the reality of my life through cutting, through substance use, um, through gambling, sex, food, whatever it is, right, yeah. that, that we can acquire an addiction for. Um, so I, I think that acknowledging and not intertwining, I, when I talk to staff and I'm doing trainings, you can have a mental health disorder of schizophrenia and have another comorbid diagnosis of gender dysphoria and another, you know, you know, substance use or mental health disorder, it doesn't mean that they're all related. And I think oftentimes providers tend to lump it all together. Well, if we just get you through your transition, it's all going to go away. And that's not necessarily the case. Or if we just get you to stop using, then everything will be fine. And that's just not true. I mean, a good clinician worth their salt is looking at all the components and how do we work on each of the things concurrently. You can't just say, okay, stop using and it's all going to be better or go see a therapist and you won't be depressed anymore or transition or whatever it is. Um, you have to take all of the whole person and treat the whole person, which oftentimes I don't think clinicians always do or treatment facilities for that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think you know, really taking a look at the trauma, because a lot of times that's the thing that we're missing underneath all of that stuff. Those are learned coping mechanisms to deal with something that might be underneath the surface so far that nobody really gets to it. I think that's a really important part of it is taking a look at that and working through that. And I've I've noticed a when I've been conversations about shared trauma amongst our community, it's, you know, whether it's you know, LGBTQ targeted shootings or, you know, laws or just in general, the atmosphere of a state you live in. I'm from a really small town in Ohio uh, and I moved to Florida. Both atmospheres are very different, but uh, it is hard to be an LGBTQ individual in a place where, you know, Orlando, we are so blessed in Orlando to kind of have um, this bubble of of support. Um, but there's times where, you know, I'll, we'll be at like Universal or we'll be at like a public place or a museum or whatever. And my partner will get misgendered and it turns into, then she starts to funnel into fear and anxiety. She wants to leave where we're at. And I didn't understand for a while until it came from a place of trauma and this trauma of having friends who are misgendered and, you know, were the victim of a hate crime. And having that fear, that constant fear that just by being yourself, you are a target, it's caused a lot of uh, deep trauma that doesn't necessarily have one uh, event or instance that it caused, but a continual trauma that continues to happen and be brought up when, I mean, the news is on or an article on, on Instagram or something. Right. Absolutely. Even for allies like myself, this year has been very challenging. I've gotten death threats, letters to my work, my home. I've had hate emails a lot. So even as an ally, you know, so that's just a drop in the bucket compared to what my LGBTQ family members and friends and community have been through. But a glimpse of that this year has been very eye-opening. Yeah. And so even for myself being harassed, doing the, the work that I do and that other allies do in the community, it can be, I mean, even the woman that was just putting up a pride flag, I think it was in Arizona or California, and she was just being a good ally and was shot and killed. I mean, these are the things that you hear about and read about. I mean, and I walk around with a rainbow in my head. So for a lot of people, they're like, aren't you worried something's going to happen? But something could happen anyway. So if we constantly live in fear, then those people win. So being as safe and smart as you can and then creating that safe, smart environment for the community to be able to come to and breathe a sigh of relief so they can work on whatever they need to work on is essential um, to decrease suicide, to cr promote understanding in the community so maybe there'll be less hate crimes. That's, you know, kind of the drive for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. 
what are what are some su- like success stories or different uh, situations you felt like really showed the work that you guys have been doing um, in the LGBTQ specific area of the VA? Yeah. Or just in general, what are some successes you've seen in the past? I mean, it's been hard. I yeah. Been hard. Um, you know, I've been at the VA for 18 years and the last 13 years I've done the LGBTQ work, but it was a population along with addictions, which is my other specialty, um, you know, that I've had close and dear to my heart working individuals in those communities. So um, a recent success is um, we've had a policy in place since uh, almost 10 years about bathrooms. The state has a certain viewpoint on that, but we're the federal government, so we are exempt from state. Um, And I just had bathroom signage added in all our VA facilities. It says um, the multi-stall bathrooms. It says Uh, Per our policy, you can utilize a bathroom that aligns with your gender identity. And those were just placed up in all of our facilities. And I I think it's amazing. Right. So things like that, those little little, I was just going to say, it's little things like that that you can pick up on. And I know one of our hospitals here has gender neutral bathrooms, too, which is a sign of a safe space as well. We have single stalls, gender neutral bathrooms, but the multi stalls I wanted to have signage on too. Mm-hmm. So that was something that recent, but even all the safety symbols, you know, I, I am our Vizin, which is our region lead. So the, we're Vizin 8, which is the islands, Florida and South Georgia. And um, I'm our LGBTQ veteran care coordinator lead. And in that role, um, I had all of my VCCs, that's what we call us, though, because we love our acronyms in VA, <laughs> all came to the VA a couple weeks ago for a conference I had with them. And when they walked around our hospital, they were saying all the lanyards, the ally buddy badges, the signage, you know, please let me know your name and pronouns when you check in so I can address you appropriately. They were very impressed with that. But these are other LGBTQ veteran care coordinators at other VAs in our right. in our catchment right. area. And, and in state. And so, you know, like, how did you do that? And spreading that knowledge to not just my region, but across the country. I've mentored a lot of new veteran care coordinators throughout the country doing this. I'm kind of an old timer at 13 years doing the work in VA. But um, just those little things do make a huge The safe place designations um, for our Orange I County place. firmly believe language yeah. is so important in changing stigmas and cha- making any kind of change. Absolutely. Um, for our viewers that are listening that may not understand or know pronouns, maybe you've seen he, he or she or they on a business card. What yes. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? What it, What is that? How, what does it mean? And we definitely encourage that in our healthcare system, but I encourage that throughout community organizations and everything else, whether it's uh, when I have my lanyard on, I have a pronoun pin that says my pronouns are she and her. That encourages others to share with you because people see that, they read that, they understand that. Um, you know, I have it in my signature line, in my email replies, and I encourage other staff to do that. Also in Teams, we are now able to put a preferred name we'd like to be addressed by or our pronouns next to our name. So anytime we're in a Teams call across the country, they can see the name I want to be addressed by. They can see my pronouns. Awesome. And that decreases misgendering mm-hmm. and, you know, um, u- utilizing a wrong name. Um, and that can be helpful in any setting. All those little things add up to encourage others to share their name and pronouns with you, uh, whether we're talking about coworkers and fellow employees or we're talking about patients that we work with. Mm-hmm. Um, sharing one's pronouns allows and opens the door for others to share how they'd like to be addressed. I, I say all the time when I do trainings, I'm like, you know, my, my name is Carrie and my pronouns are she and her. If people kept calling me Steve or mistering me or calling me he, I wouldn't be happy about that. So it's not okay, and it's against our policy, our national policy, to not use the name and pronouns that the employee or the patient. So changing policy can also be helpful in saying this is not okay, and if you can't be respectful of somebody's name and pronouns, and maybe this isn't the setting for you to work in. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely appropriate when we talk about putting, you know, pronouns and signatures or on pins, appropriate self-disclosure of identity has been one of the things that I think makes a big difference in how we can treat people where it's like, you know, when we say, hi, my name's Shani, my pronouns are she, her, you know, then I find that people also follow line and it avoids the, you know, if someone says, hey, my pronouns are they, them, it avoids the conversation later on about having it and they don't have to have that conversation 20 times with 20 different people. It's just this is who I am and where who you are in front of you. And there's not as many individual conversations which can increase that anxiety that 
feeling of not in being in place or being other than. Um, so I think the less we have to have the conversation about uh, someone's identity in a workplace, the the easier it is for someone to be themselves in the workplace. Yes. And normalizing it as an ally allows others that could be allies to join the fold, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Because I think a lot of people, th I, I get often, well, why do you do that? You're an ally. Why do you do that work? Or why do you share your pronouns or your name or whatever? Because if I do it as an ally, then maybe other allies will join and do the same so that we could maybe make it a more welcoming world, yeah. you know, yeah. and kind of space for people. So I know there's some anxiety by some people about maybe not using the right terminology. Yeah, it's I don't want to step on a landmine. I don't want to, you know, and some good intention too. like I don't want to make a mistake. Um, and I think. One, it's okay to make mistakes as long as you're trying. Yes. Um, but from your perspectives, any thoughts on that or tips for someone out there who might not know or feel educated enough on that? I always tell people it's okay to not know it all. Even as a subject matter expert myself, I still mess up sometimes. It's okay because terminology continues to grow and evolve and change. Sure. I mean, in the time that I've been doing the work, it's a lot different. Even a term like queer, for me growing up, that was derogatory. But a lot of my younger LGBTQ veterans prefer that. Uh, yeah, whether claim Exactly. Yeah. And so I go, okay, Carrie needs to deal with her own stuff about the term. It's because this person in front of me is telling me that's how they identify, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, being understanding that my younger veterans may prefer that, but my older veterans may not prefer right. that or any LG LGBTQ person, not just necessarily a veteran. So I think it is important. I think it's all about time and place mm -hmm. because okay. people get very nervous about those things that you mentioned. I'm a say, say yeah. it wrong, do it wrong, whatever. So I've encouraged, you know, staff even in our facilities, and people could do this in their own facilities. For us, we have an easy out. We use veteran as the first name. So I'll say veteran Smith or veteran Jones. Once I get them back to a private place and space, then I give them my name and pronouns and ask them how they'd like to be addressed and what terminology they use. Because if it's private, it's respectful, then you get all that information. Doing that in the lobby or out, you know, in the hallways or on the corner. So I think it's all about kind of what energy you give and empathy that you give and understanding that you give. Yeah, yeah. But also the privacy aspect of it. Um, not asking for in, in inpatient, for example. I need a urinalysis because you're going for, you know, surgery or whatever. And saying that to a trans man openly in front of other p patients, you're just outed that person. Mm -hmm. So time and place, I think, is key. Do I have patients that don't like, uh, I had a, a patient, for an example, say, I don't like transgender. I prefer transsexual. Well, I tell people all the time that's kind of outdated and that's not really a term that we use anymore. But if the person in front of me is saying, I prefer transsexual, and she was very adamant about it, then I'm going to utilize transsexual if that's what she would prefer, even though I might not necessarily be okay with it. This person is telling me that they are. Mm -hmm. And then I've had straight cisgender patients that are like, why are you asking this? Why are you telling me your name and pronouns? You know, I'm so tired of all this and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And it's like, listen, if it's not applicable to you, it's OK not to have a discussion about it. But here's the other thing. We have patients that go by nicknames, middle names and other names. So to it is applicable to you. I have plenty of veteran patients that. Go buy a nickname, call me Billy Bob or call me, you know, you know, whatever it may be or a middle name. Yeah. I have straight cisgender veterans that are like, listen, I've my name is Chris, but everybody's always called me Pat. So it is honoring somebody may go by a different name mm -hmm. and use different terminology for themselves. And they might not be a part of the LGBTQ community. So it is including everybody when we do these things. Yeah. I think a lot of times, too, um, approaching corrections from someone advocating for themselves with gratitude. So, like, you know, they're even being in the community. There are times where I've made mistakes with friends' pronouns or if someone just transitioned, you know, I'm learning as well among them about how to address them properly for, you know, a, a different circumstance, you know. And, you know, I've said, you know, oh, like she was doing this. And it was like they'd be like, hey, you know, I, they them pronouns. Now I'd say thank you. Yes. And and I thank them for the correction instead of being like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'll be better and giving them this um, kind of overbearing reassurance that I'm trying. If I mm -hmm. say thank you, it's like 
I'm glad you're advocating for yourself. I appreciate you, you know, educating. I love that. It's yeah. coming at it with a sense of gratitude instead of defensiveness yes. or apologizing, I think has created a, a better atmosphere for people. Safe to, space. Yeah, to feel yeah. like they can correct people. They can say something. And you're not making it about you because I think yes. when people <laughs> apologize, they make it about themselves versus about it's like I'm such a good ally, I'm right? Trying. And I, yeah. which is great. I'm glad people are trying, but it, it comes to a point where this is someone else's identity. Right. Yeah. This is something that someone else has to, over and over again, re self disclose to people, and they they probably don't want to have to, uh, you know, go on yeah. a whole conversation. Uh, so we see some of the highest suicide rates in individuals that identify as LGBTQ plus. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about that and maybe, you know, what that individual's going through and ways that we can provide resources and safe spaces? Absolutely. Um, suicide rate obviously is much higher, especially with the population I work with. Mm -hmm. Veteran suicide is high. Yes. Then you add LGBTQ to yes. that. Then you add a mental health and or substance abuse diagnosis and the layers just continue and continue. So, um, which increases the possibility for suicide, as we know. So um, having, I mean, we have the crisis line, which is available to anybody. Uh, Veterans Press 1, but everybody else can call 988, uh, which is a great resource 24-7. There's a trans lifeline that's a community um, resource, a SAGE hotline for aging. So you just have to press 988 yep. and it'll guide you. Yep. Okay. Unless you're a veteran, you press 1. And that takes them to our call center. Okay. Um, and then those are routed. We have a whole suicide prevention team mm -hmm. um, at the VA. It was one person many years ago, and now we've got lots of people, That's which awesome. is great. Yeah. yeah. Um, but and that, that gets routed to us. And then our suicide prevention team has to follow up with those veterans that called from our catchment area. And that would be true from wherever the veteran called from. Um, but even the crisis hotline, even if you're not a veteran, you can still call it. And it, they can guide you to care in your local area, but also make sure you're safe. So if you're saying, hey, listen, this is what I'm thinking about doing, they can guide the police to where you are yeah. as well. Um, but knowing um, that those many layers that I talked about cr create higher suicide rates, uh, we've definitely tried to work. I work very closely with my suicide prevention team because of that fact um, in trying to minimize veteran suicide, first and foremost. Secondly, obviously, uh, LGBTQ uh, suicides as well. Um, there's a reason that it's so high because these individuals are validated, they aren't supported. Um, and when you don't have a support network and you're not validated about who you are, and then you have a thing like the Transgender Day of Remembrance every year because we honor lives taken um, and things like that, you think maybe this isn't the place for me or the state I'm living in doesn't care about me uh, or my country or my world or what have you. Um, which always breaks my heart. Um, nobody should ever feel like they don't belong here just because of who they love or how they identify. And if more people said that out loud to their fellow humans, I think that we'd probably be in a better place mm -hmm. and space. And I know it seems simple and stupid, but all those things, if we're kind to just each person we encounter every day, can definitely lower. Well, it's like the touch points that we were talking, the lanyards, the pins, the yeah. little tiny things that we do add up so much. And you mentioned support system, and it reminds me of the fact that, like, we have, I mean, our local peer support space, like, yeah. there is specific peer support, like, peer. The, someone said it recently, the peer support is life support. Mm -hmm. You know, not only does this person have a identity that you, you know, resonate with, but they have been through similar traumas. They have been through similar feelings. And, you know, our, the local LGBTQ gender affirming respite home is coming to be. And it's like, all of these spaces are, are, allowing people to say like you know i have a whole half of my family that doesn't believe in lgbtq rights and i don't associate with them that is a common story people yeah. coming out and losing whatever support system they had it's a main barrier to people coming out national coming out day things that are celebratory pride national coming out day for people who aren't out who or people who have come out and lost their support system because of it those days are are grieving days and so I think the important thing for me to remember with the community is that, you know, everything is both sensitive and important sometimes. And and having peer support alongside the rest of the clinical care has been, I think, one of the bigger differences in our area um, for a, dec a hopefully a decrease in suicides. 
And we have peer support staff at the VA too, which not a lot of people are aware of. We've got great community resources like It's amazing to see more and more peer support. We yes. introduced it to so our much. facilities as well, and I'm super excited about it. And we're getting our first LGBTQ peer support oh, staff. That's great. He starts that's awesome. in two weeks, so I'm super excited. So well, It's wonderful to see things moving yeah. in the right direction, and it's exciting to see some of this happening in our community. Um Thank you guys so much for being here and sharing today. This was such an important conversation. We talked a little bit about stigma, what someone should look like if they're needing that additional level of care of support. Uh, we talked a little bit about veterans. We talked about our community here in Central Florida, which is pretty unique as well. Um, I appreciate you both so much and the opinions and the conversation today. And thank you, viewers, for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about our facilities, you can check out Palm Point Behavioral in Titusville, Florida, Central Florida Behavioral next door to SeaWorld in Orlando, University Behavioral Center on the east side of Orlando, a residential care with La Mastad. If you want to know more about Carrie Griffin over at Orlando VA, she is a licensed therapist, also a CAP as well. Yes. And um, and she can easily be found on the internet as well. So thanks again for being with us and we'll see you next time. Take care.